first service here on Sunday morning. <clears throat> We're still praying for Pastor Ed for recovery. He's been trending good on a lot of things, but still just needs to rest, which is against his nature. He's a worker. He's, a, he's been working over the years, plowing the field, and uh, just keep him in prayer for that, that he can just, just rest and be good with it. Um, <clears throat> But we're in Luke chapter 5 this morning. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 5. I'm going to pick up right around verse 27. Jesus is up in the area where he grew up, the Galilee area up in in the north. He's been going about teaching. He's been preaching the kingdom of God. This was his message, the gospel of the kingdom of God, there's huge crowds now coming out everywhere he goes, and in those crowds are scribes and Pharisees. There's common folk. Most of the crowd consists of just the common people that want to be near him, and they want to hear his teaching. They want to see the kingdom that's being manifest in Christ. Everything he's doing is a manifestation of the kingdom of God, the forgiveness of sins, the healing of diseases, the delivery from demonic oppression and harassment. These are all in in heaven. There's not going to be any of that. There won't be anybody who's not forgiven. There won't be any more harassment, spiritual warfare. And so the scribes and Pharisees are coming out now from every town we saw in a, a couple weeks ago. Every town from the Galilee up north Every, ta- every town from the southern region, Judea, <clears throat> and they were coming from Jerusalem. They're coming out now to oppose him. They're coming to oppose him, and so we're seeing many different layers as to why the religious elite are so mad at Jesus, because they're being driven by anger. This anger that will culminate at one point to them pushing the Romans to crucify him. They want him dead. Okay, we're seeing the stark contrast between what the Bible calls the world and the kingdom of God. We're seeing this contrast between sick and deforming religion and everything that Jesus is about. This is what we're seeing. Now, the the New Testament is clear that Jesus was without sin. He didn't have any sin, but the Scribes and Pharisees, according to them, he was guilty of all sorts of sin in their definition. We've seen them angry at him because he's healed people on Saturday. That's a great evil, right? Can't be healing people on Saturday. Can't be helping people on Saturday. Our rules, our regulations forbid this and Jesus did it anyway. And it was no sin according to scripture, only according to their tradition. We saw last time they they just went ballistic because he forgave a man his sins. A man who'd been a paralytic. Who had felt his whole life that God's after me because I must have some special kind of category of sin in my life. And Jesus said, man, your sins are forgiven. And man, these guys, the scribes and Pharisees went crazy. He's, he, he had no sin, the Bible tells us. Jesus had no sin, but the scribes and Pharisees ac- accused him of being sinful, saying, you're not serious enough, Jesus. Why do your disciples eat and drink? They're always having a good time around the table. While the, while the, the disciples of the Pharisees and of John the Baptist, they, they're fasting all the time. You're not serious. You're not a good example. You're not. You're. 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 You're enjoying life too much. <laughs> and God had only given one fast for Israel once a week. These guys fasted twice a week because it was all a big religious one-upsmanship game that they had started. That was totally carnal and self-serving, ego-serving, not God-serving. And Jesus exposed it all. The sin that they're going to accuse Christ of in our text this morning is that Jesus befriends, he befriends people whom they had labeled as sinners, as if they, the scribes and Pharisees, are not sinners, okay? 
This is the big thing that has them all worked up. You know, Jesus associated with all kinds of people. And that infuriated these guys. These, whole, these guys' whole thing was separation, okay? The word Pharisee means separate ones. We're separate. We're better than everybody else. We're the holy ones. And they would pull their robes in whenever anybody else got near them so that they wouldn't be defiled by other people, by the people that weren't keeping their rules and playing their game. They thought salvation came by separation. Jesus, we see, brings salvation through association. This is what we're going to see in the text this morning. They thought salvation came by separation. Jesus shows here in our text this morning that he brings salvation through association. Part of their sense, albeit a false sense, a really a self right, of self-righteousness, it, it was that they kept away from folks that essentially weren't playing or weren't interested in their religious game but in playing by the rules they made up. The only ones that the scribes and Pharisees associated with were those that were playing the game according to their rules and regulations. And they held up those rules and regulations as we saw in a couple weeks ago as if they were the word of God, the commandment of God. And Jesus says, no, they're not. You guys have taken what God said and you've added to it and added to it and now it's, now it's tradition, but nobody stops and thinks. That's not the word of God. That's the traditions that have been handed down. And he says, but you, you load these things on people until they're crushed, until they can't even breathe spiritually. We've seen that they had a rule, they've had a, that they had a regulation to deform and to make awkward pretty much every single area of life. This was their religion. This was the system that had developed. The Pharisees made every effort to keep away from those who didn't honor their scruples. You know, if you're not freaked out about the things I'm freaked out about, I'm going to keep myself away from you. <laughs> Jesus wasn't freaked out pretty much about anything. So he drove them mad. He drove them crazy. You know, Jesus comes on the scene rebuking these guys for hindering or pushing out those that he, that God had come in Christ to bring in. Jesus is rebuking these guys, let me repeat that, for hindering, for pushing out. You see, they had, they had authority. They were the religious elite. People looked at them. Everyone's looking at them like, these are the guys. And they were pushing out those that God in Christ had come to bring in, the common folk. He came and he befriended. Jesus actually befriended. This is what they're outraged to th this morning in our text. He actually befriended these sinners. That the scribes and Pharisees, that they, that they made sure that they stayed away from these people. These people, like, this, you know, in our religious system, you got to stay away from these people. And Jesus walks up and he befriends them. He eats and he drinks with them. A sign of acceptance of the person, of the person. I accept you. I receive you at my table. You're a friend. You're like family. This is what Jesus did with these folks that the scribes and Pharisees had ostracized and stigmatized and pushed out. Jesus befriended them and man, the scribes and Pharisees are going nuts. Jesus turned to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 21, 31, and he said, you know, these sinners, these that you call sinners, these that you've categorized under that label, and he says there in Matthew 21, 31, specifically, you know, these prostitutes and tax collectors, 
they're actually entering the kingdom of God before you guys. Can you imagine? I mean, these dudes, their heads must have just started exploding. These prostitutes and tax collectors are actually entering the kingdom of heaven before you guys. You're the religious honchos, man. And the prostitutes and the tax collectors are entering before you. These common folks that are willing to admit that they're sick and that they need a doctor. And here you are in this delusion that you, and you think you're holier than everybody they are entering present tense, present continuous tense. To enter the kingdom of God, when, they, when Jesus spoke about this, it wasn't something that, that, that happens out, way out in the future after you die. It's something that you begin to, it happens right now in your life. You were blind and now you see. You lived uh, abusing and using people and now you see people through the eyes of Christ, you begin to perceive the kingdom of heaven right now and walk in sync with it. That's what he was talking about. These prostitutes and tax collectors are seeing the kingdom and they're beginning to walk in sync with it and you religious Pharisees are still completely blind. You haven't even gotten to the threshold of the door yet. Whoa. Radical. This had the scribes and Pharisees with their boxers all in a bunch. After these things, verse 27, after Jesus forgave the sin of the paralytic and healed him that we saw last week, after these things, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. Okay, now if you've watched some cartoon children's version of this, it's just so sweet and all, you know, but you have to understand the tax collector. We've got IRS workers in our church here and this is a different deal. You can't equate what a tax collector was here in Israel in the first century with someone who works for the IRS today. At this time, Rome had marched in and annexed Israel and they were by force extracting taxes from the Jews. The Jews hated this. Like, vehemently there were some groups that were radicals like assassins that hated this occupation of Rome so badly but these to collect taxes the Romans would employ Jewish men who were willing to go and get as much money as they could out of their fellow Jew okay Rome would set the amount they said well this is the amount we want we're giving you the backing of the Roman army, but you can go and extract whatever more you want to line your own pockets. These tax collect this was a recipe, by the way, for corruption. You can feel it, right? This is mafioso. Okay, this is what this is. Some of the IRS people that come here and audit our books every year, we have it audited. They're, they're just the most sweet, upright, reasonable people you could ever meet, you know. Um, these, the, 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 the tax collectors here were not those people, okay? These guys were mafia. They were hated. They were hated by everybody. They were corrupt. They used threats and fear as one of their tactics of, you know, getting money. They were regarded by the culture as outcasts. By the Jewish culture, they were, they were completely regarded as outcasts. They were disqualified from holding a position of judge. They were excommunicated from all the synagogues. They were not welcome in worship. Okay, these guys, I mean, they, they, they took the job because it was very lucrative. But they were cut off. So Jesus, now, he comes and he sees Levi sitting at the tax office. He sees this tax collector. This is who he's looking at, one of these guys. And he intentionally calls Levi out loud, I want you to be my disciple. He said to him, follow me. When a rabbi says, follow me, it means I want you to be my disciple. I'm giving you an opportunity to be a disciple of me, Rabbi Jesus. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? 
that God would want this man. Who would have thought? God would have thought. Okay, this is a very God thing, not a churchy thing, not a safe thing, not a tidy thing, not a comfortable thing, but this is what God would do, and this is what God does. He calls men, he calls women like Levi, outcasts, people that have made terrible mistakes, people that have been caught up in drugs and maybe in the underworld. And he calls people like many of us. I, I was never in the mafia. My, my, my story's so boring. <laughs> I grew up in a white middle class family and went off to college and did pretty good in college and then got a job. And I came to the Lord. My heart was so empty. I was like, there has to be more to this life. And God calls people like us too. I'm never addicted to drugs. But Levi gave Jesus, notice Levi, he, he leaves everything. He gets up, he goes, he leaves the thug life and he's following Christ now. And Levi's response to this invitation is to throw a huge party. And imagine, you can imagine the money this guy had, the money that these types of guys have. You know, these mafiosa types, they're making money, you know, under the table. And he no doubt had a huge big house and he threw a great feast. This speaks of this lavish feast with the foods and the wines and the, you know, the bands and the whole thing. And it says at this party that he's throwing here for Jesus that there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. So he invites all of his friends. Levi's so compelled by what he sees of God in Christ that he's thinking, I want all my friends to see him. He's so different than the religious people that have just completely spit on us and put us in boxes and called us hopeless. I want all my friends to see God in Jesus Christ. I want them to know him. I want my friends to find what I've found in him. That's what this party's about. That's what this party is all about. So Levi throws this party, invites his friends. There's Jesus among them. There's Jesus among them. He's not supposed to be there according to the scribes and Pharisees. He's actually eating and drinking with them. This is an extension of the hand of friendship in that culture. He's eating and drinking with these folks. And who are these folks? Who are Levi's friends that are there at the party? Well, if you're an outcast, if you are considered, if you've been boxed and labeled in that category of the dregs of society you know, for whatever reason, the only friends you can have, the only friends that you would have are other people that have that, they're in that same box with that same label. Here's Jesus with all the ostracized and all the outcasts, all the ones that the holier than thou religious folks said, nope, you guys are out. You know, it tells us, it tells us in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, the, the account, Mark's account of this same story, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus at the table and his disciples, Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, there were many of these people, there weren't just a few, and it says, and they followed him. So these folks that Jesus is extending this friendship, these folks that were stigmatized and ostracized by the culture and by the religious honchos, there's many of them now and they're following Christ. Look at what's happening here. Is that a good thing? They're following Christ. Well, are they saved? Have they completely repented? I don't know. But the, they're following Christ the best chance that they have to actually get saved if they're not already saved is to be following Christ. They're following him around because they're drawn to him. They're compelled by the person of Christ. Who is that? It's God who is manifest in flesh and they don't want to leave. They want to follow him everywhere he goes. What's happening here? Jesus is extending friendship to this Levi and his outcast friends, to these ragamuffins 
who've been ostracized by the culture, stigmatized by the religious honchos. Jesus is extending friendship, follow this, to these people whose sin, whose sin has been deemed by the religious elite as having deal breaker sin. The, the religious system that the Pharisees functioned in Inside their system, they deemed the sin of these people deal breaker. They have, they're, they've, they're, they're committing the deal breaker sins. And why did they do that? So they could feel better about their own sins. And this is part of the sick religious system that Jesus is going around blowing up because it's totally not from God. It's a sick religious system. And we'll talk more on that in a minute. That's a main point in the message this morning. And we, we, we want to make sure we're not functioning in that system where we're, where we're ostracizing certain people and their sin and we've deemed it deal breaker be, because we need, to feel, we need to have somebody that we can feel better than. Okay, that's not, that's not what Christ does in our lives. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But Jesus is extending friendship to these. He's eating fish and bread, drinking wine with these outcasts and loving on them. This is scandalous stuff to the scribes and the Pharisees. It's scandalous stuff. And yet these marginalized folks, they're feeling God's love. They're seeing the kingdom of God in him. They're so drawn to him now that they're all following him. They're all following him. All these other mafia dudes these shady characters, drug dealers, <laughs> you know, prostitutes. Rag, I call it, it's a ragamuffin group. How do the scribes and Pharisees feel about all this? Well, they got their boxers in a bunch, like I said. The scribes and the Pharisees complained. Notice there, verse 30, the scribes and the Pharisees complained. Of course they did. That's what the religious spirit is always doing. The churchy religious spirit is always complaining. Their scribes and the Pharisees complained, notice, against the disciples. They're afraid to go directly to Jesus, so they're, gonna, they're complaining to the disciples, saying, why do you, you and Jesus, why are you all eating with these people? What are you doing eating with these people? You should be... You should be shunning these people. You should be shutting them out. What are you doing opening your, uh, your house to these people and you're, you're inviting them to your table? What are you doing? You know, again, in this culture, to eat with people was a sign that you accept that person as a, fr as a friend, as, as, as a person, you affirm them. Not that you agree with maybe everything they're doing, you're not, it doesn't mean you affirm, because everybody's got stuff that, that, that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. We're all broken. It's not an affirmation of sin. It's an affirmation of the person. This is what Jesus is doing. He's affirming the person. These are people. How'd they get into the business they're in? How did they get into the situation? Everybody's got a different story, and we can't just blanket condemn and judge Jesus is affirming them as people he's why and the, the 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 Pharisees are like what are you doing you know they want Jesus's disciples <laughs> to give an account for what Jesus is doing and for what Jesus has had has now led them into they're kind of pulling the disciples over going what is this guys and I can imagine the disciples in their mind, this is my speculation, being asked this question. I can imagine the disciples thinking, you know what? Jesus never asks us permission to do what he does, but he, he does what he does. And, and to tell you the truth, I can imagine this being the disciples, you know, kind of response to these guys complaining. He keeps reaching out to people that, to be honest, initially, we're, we're always a little bit uncomfortable with the people that he's reaching out to. But he keeps going there. He keeps going to the woman caught in adultery, you know, and then he's shielding her. And, 
and, and he's looking at the Pharisees and he's driving them off one by one. And then he goes to a woman at the well and she's had five husbands. The, she not, he, you know, he, and they, they thought, you're not supposed to be talking to her. It's a woman and she's not Jewish. And it, you're talk, he keeps doing this stuff that we're kind of uncomfortable with, but then he, he calls us over there to love these people like he loves them. And you know what? Something's happening in us. We're being stretched. We're being stretched and we're, we're experiencing more love for more people than we ever have. And is it uncomfortable? Yes, it's uncomfortable, but this, it's actually kind of cool what's happening in us. The scribes and the Pharisees complain to the disciples. How can he be eating with these people? How can he be doing this? How can he associate with these people? And maybe some of you here today, you've been made to feel that you're disqualified from the kingdom of heaven and certainly from ever being used of God. Maybe, it, maybe some church people made you feel that way. Maybe some of you feel that perhaps you don't know because you don't know yet what the Bible actually teaches, that you think that you got this idea in your head that you are uniquely sinful and that you're a hopeless case. That's because you don't know the Bible yet. Because the Bible doesn't say that you're a uniquely sinful person and that you're this, in this category different than the rest of us that's called hopeless. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We're all equally jacked up, if you would say. Everybody has sinned in the past, Paul the Apostle said, and everybody presently falls short of the glory of God. We are all equally desperate for the grace of God. No matter who you are here today, what's going on in your head space, <laughs> as you look around and wonder who are all these people? Because you don't know all these people, you know your own self. I could tell you about all these people right now real quick. They're all just like you. We're all, we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. We all are desperate for God's grace. We're all in the same boat. You know, someone once said that's what fellowship is, right? Two fellows in the same ship. We're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. We all need Christ. Let me say this to you this morning. Jesus Christ offers his friendship to you. He wants to eat and drink with you. Yes, you. You. He knows your issues. He knows, more, he knows more about your issues than you do. He knows all the ones you know about so far and the ones that you don't even realize that you're dealing with. And he says, you, hey, you. I want you to follow me. I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to drink with you. I want you to follow me. I want to be your friend, says Jesus. Wow. Jesus comes breaking through the whole religious world, the whole religious Pharisee world, and he's, he goes after the people that they've pushed away, and he says, I want to bring you in. You. I want to bring you in. And so the scribes and the Pharisees, what they're doing here with their question to the disciples is they're trying to shame them. This is huge in the religious game. It's the tool of shame. They're trying to shame them. What, is, what are you guys doing eating with these people? It's shame. And before the disciples could say anything, Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick they're the ones that need the doctor. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to a repentance. And a repentance, the literal translation, repent, it's a compound word in the Greek, meta noius. Meta, where we get metamorphosis, it, it, it speaks of a change. Noius is the word for mind. The word repent means change your mind. No, I thought it meant change your behavior. No, it doesn't. But when your mind is changed, your behavior, it's already done. If I look at you like you're a worthless piece of slime that evolved out of the goo and you're just a, you're taking up space and clogging up room on the freeway, you know, breathing in precious oxygen, I'm going to treat you 
like a worthless piece of goo that, that evolved out of the slime over whatever. But if I see you as created in the image of God, if I see you that way, you, no one has to tell me, like, treat, treat, treat him nicely. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to meet you. you. Creatures created in the image of God, worth so much that God gave his son for you. You see, it's a change of mind. And that brings real, authentic, lasting change of behavior towards people. I haven't come to call the righteous. And Jesus knows there are no righteous. He knows what Paul would say later in Romans 3.10. There no, there's none righteous, no, not one. I mean, these guys are acting like we're the righteous ones. We're the holier than thou. He's like, I haven't come to call guys like you. But I've come to call people like these that are sitting around this table at this party these people that everyone else has pushed away I've come to call them and to come to call them to a change of mind and here's the change of mind for them God's not against you like the religious community has been telling you God is for you and he wants to forgive you and give you new life God is not saying you're out and you're a hopeless case. Change your mind. I'm here calling you in. There's radical hope for you. I'm going to blow your mind and lead you in the purpose I created you for. Change your mind. Okay? What a trip. You see, the Pharisees in their religious system Okay, we're back over here to this, the, the world, the religious system of the Pharisees, the stark contrast between them and what Jesus is all about. The, the, the religious system they functioned in. They needed, they needed somebody. They needed some group of people that they could label sinners and deem their sin as the deal breaker sin so they could feel better about their own. Why? Because they weren't drawing their righteousness off of the one place where it is to be found, which is in Christ and Him crucified. So they, they didn't have any righteousness, so what they had to do is they had to say, there's these people over here that have this sin that we don't happen to struggle with. Their sin is the deal breaker. Now we can feel better about our own. This is a sick, religious thing that is prevalent even today even in many churches. This is not the salvation of Christ. And it equals, it equals action towards people that doesn't look like Jesus because it's an idolatrous religious system where you're getting righteousness. It's an illusion of righteousness from a false source. These people that the scribes and Pharisees, they can't believe Jesus is eating with these guys. These are the ones that they had labeled as, these are the deal breaker sinners. They can't allow it to Jesus, for Jesus to let them out of that category because then their whole religious system collapses. Because the, 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 the way they've been getting righteousness, or at least the sense of righteousness, was by stealing righteousness from them. Going, they, oh they... Oh, 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 those disgusting people. At least we're not doing what they're doing. And Jesus is like, I'm, he's just going to go love on these people and he's going to bring them the true righteousness, which is by faith. If you're a believer in Christ here this morning, if you're a believer... Your sins are gone. They're gone. Listen, and not just that. It's not just a deletion. The salvation thing, when you receive Christ, it's not just sins deleted. Now you're just kind of a blank slate. It's righteousness imputed, put into your account. It's, it's a clothing of, the, it's a clothing of your, your life and your being with the righteous robes of Christ. It's not just taking away the old filthy garments. It's putting on you the righteousness of Christ. Okay? If you're a believer here this morning, God doesn't see your sins. They're gone. He took them away on the cross and he's clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible teaches. And it's by pure gift. 
which is what the word grace is, gift. Ephesians 2, read it. Ephesians 2, chapter, verse 1 through 10. In Christ, I already have all the righteousness that I could ever need and it's all for free in him. It's already mine. Whether I'm walking in it, enjoying it or not, it's already mine. Listen, as I live in it, what is already mine for free in Christ, as I live off of what is already mine, I'm so full. I couldn't be fuller. I couldn't have more righteousness and thus I have no need to put anybody else down like Jesus never put anybody down. He never put sinners down, prostitutes down, never put tax collectors down. He never went, oh yeah, just so you know, I, I, can't, I can't be seen in public with this guy. He had no need to do that, that sick religious thing because he was full. He was the righteousness of God himself. But so are you now in this world. You have no need to tell everybody how I, I don't associate with that guy because you're not, you're not stealing righteousness from that guy. You're getting righteousness from the source, from the cross of Jesus Christ. And as I walk in that, I have no need to steal righteousness from you. I have no need to let everyone know I'm not doing that. Go holy I am. I have no need for any of that. I'm free now, full now to do what? To just love people like Jesus did. Just, to just love people like Jesus did. How could he do that? What he did. That's what he did. He just loved people. He loved all the people you're not supposed to love. He was hanging out with all the people that the Pharisees were just like, I hey, can't believe he's doing this because he wasn't caught in this sick, religious, idolatrous thing of get at the illusion of righteousness by putting others down. He could just go to the marginalized, the ostracized and just love on them. The Pharisee has to steal righteousness from somebody because they haven't received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. They have to. They're compelled to play this sick game and to steal righteousness. They have to put someone in their box and label their sin as the deal breaker so they can feel better about their own. But as I enjoy the 100% forever forgiveness, yes, but I enjoy the gift of his righteousness that he's covered me with. I don't have to play that game. I can just love people. I can just love people. Whatever your issues are, I can just love you. I can have a burrito with you. <laughs> a horchata. You know, a Diet Coke. I can, we can just sit at the table. I can associate with all sorts of people. Now, if you come out of a, a blackout, fall down, drunk, alcoholic thing, don't, don't, don't go befriend people in bars. You know, just unless it's you're 20 years out and you go in with other people, be wise. Don't, Jesus was with a group. The disciples were always with a group. You know, if, you're, if you used to be a pimp and, you know, you're that whole thing and, and God's don't, don't go out witnessing to the prostitutes until and if you do if you do and you should there should be an outreach to prostitutes in every church but you should go in a group of people there's wisdom in going out in numbers because we have the potential to fall we don't want to fall we've already seen what that brings in our lives but I can eat and drink with folks that Jesus is eating and drinking with. Jesus breaks down the barrier of man's idolatrous religion that locks out people that God came to bring in. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin to bring this plane to a landing here, probably five minutes. I'm gonna mention a couple I always mention, Chuck and Kay Smith. Chuck, or Kay, Kay and Chuck Smith. It actually happened in Kay first, according to Chuck's telling of the story. But Kay began to see a generation of kids that were ostracized, hippies, heroin addicts, jobless, sh shoeless, strung out on the beach under the Huntington Beach Pier. She began to see them. Chuck didn't see it at first. She's like, honey, what the heck? 
These kids are disgusting. They stink. They need to get a haircut. They need to take a bath and get a job. That was Chuck. And then Kay said, Lord, op open my husband's eyes. And when they together saw this counterculture that almost every single church back in the 60s wanted to have nothing to do with, when Chuck and Kay Smith saw these kids and they befriended them, this is what happened. They befriended them. They embraced them. They opened their house, invited them in their house. They opened the church. These kids, these hippies all started coming and they brought their guitars in and their drums and it was scandalous. The scribes and the Pharisees of that day were scandalized, criticizing. There were articles written against him by Pharisees, against Pastor Chuck. But he's like, Jesus is doing this and I'm following him. Why are you meeting with these kids? Why are you letting these kids in? He, he chucks like going, Jesus is bringing them into our church. One of the elders of the church was a little bit slower. I talked to this guy in, in Budapest. He's still on the board at Calvary Costa Mesa. He said, I was the guy that posted the, I posted a thing on the door that said, if you don't have shoes, you're not welcome. Back when this was happening, because he was worried about the carpet. They just put new carpet down in their new sanctuary. And Pastor Chuck came and ripped the thing down. He didn't even fire this guy. The guy's been there the whole time. And Pastor Chuck called the elders together and he says, if we're so worried about the carpet, let's tear all the carpet out of the church and let the kids come. Let them come. This was exactly what Jesus was doing here with Levi and Levi's friends. There was this outreach and the exact same Pharisees in the 60s were criticizing. They didn't get it. And what was the result of Pastor Chuck befriending a generation that the church wanted to have nothing to do with? The result so far is, of over, is about 2,000 churches of hundreds and thousands of people each all over the world. Of, the result has been a hundreds of millions of dollars supplied by God to build facilities and Bible colleges and conference centers to minister to all these kids. And now they're taking it to the world on a whole new level. Chuck stepped out. He could see Jesus befriending that generation. The question for us, I have three short questions for us today as the church. Where is Jesus going right now? This isn't the 60s anymore. The whole world has shifted and changed. I'm, I'm not sure quite yet where we are. <laughs> it's changing so much. It's so crazy. But you know what? God's here. God's moving. Jesus is somewhere right now. To whom is he going right now in this generation? Who are the ostracized right now that are feeling boxed out of the church? Another question, am I willing to see them? Am I willing to see them when I see them and go to them? Am I willing to befriend? Am I willing to befriend them? A final question, am I prepared to duck? To duck the incoming fire and complaining and criticism of the modern day Pharisee because it'll happen exactly like it did here. I want to leave you with this. Think of this. Jesus calls this guy that he shouldn't call according to the religious realm. You shouldn't be talking to this guy, Levi. Levi is better known by you and us as, by the name Matthew because he's the one that eventually went on to record the gospel of Matthew. This is Matthew. Jesus befriended him and he went from mafia, kingpin, threatening, scary guy to being used of God to bring us the gospel of Matthew. Just think about how many Matthews are out there. How many Matthews are out there in the most rugged, rough costumes right now? These characters underneath. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would show us, Lord, you would show us here at the packing house where you are and who you're reaching out to. We want to reach out at the impulse of your love. We're your body, Lord. 
When we reach for something, it's through our own bodies. When our mind says, I want something off the top shelf, our arm reaches up, our hand grasps it, and we bring it down. Lord, where, where are you reaching? Who are you embracing? Who are you befriending? In this generation, Lord, we pray that we would be a people, a church. In, as individuals, we would be moved at the impulse of your love. That we might enjoy the thrill of the Spirit of God filling our lives and supplying all of our needs to reach yet another generation for your glory. We pray that you would show us this, Lord. And if there's anyone here this morning, maybe you feel like you're the one that has been boxed out. There's such a strong box in your mind. You've been told or you've told yourself. You're the hopeless case. Jesus says, I want you, I want you to follow me. I want to be your friend. If that's you and your desire like Levi right now is to stand up and follow, I would just ask while everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed that you would look up real quick at me and signal me somehow. I want to pray for you. Anybody here feel like, man, Pastor, you describe me. And the joy of my heart would be to follow him. This is good news indeed. Anybody here? Just lift a hand up and a little signal. Okay. Lord, we just praise you and, and ask that you would work this in us, Father. Work this in us for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody agreed by saying out loud together. Amen.